summer 75 was the last time the Pink Floyd members saw Sid Barrett. He left London for good after a period of eight years. Rosemary Barrett. He lived in Chelsea Cloisters for some years, and, but it was a bad time. He was very lonely and eventually money became a problem because brown envelopes went straight into the bin. So he came home to stay with mum. He was quite distressed for a long time. But there, we're talking years and years and years, aren't we? Probably 10 years plus of chaos. He eventually, after some years, sorted himself out and he got himself a life with me and my mother. Throughout the 80s, Sid lived the life of a recluse occasionally photographed by the tabloids looking portly, wandering in Cambridge. He continued to paint and draw, but never pursued music again. Things changed for him in 1991, when his mother passed away, and Sid became the responsibility of his sister. I didn't see him every day. I'd see him two or three times a week. He needed a, a lot of support, in lots of ways, really, to learn how to live. He'd forgotten... You get up, you have breakfast, you go shopping, you come back, you have lunch. The normal routine of a day, it had never really featured in his life. It was a worry. It was a worry. I, I did perhaps take it too seriously, but I did love him perhaps too much. <laughs> so he learned slowly, but he was content, and that was what I strived for for him, was contentment. And I think, I think he achieved it. Sid Barrett died on July the 7th due to complications relating to diabetes. He was 60. His stare would beam down from magazines, newspapers and television news reports as the media relived his myth. Sid scored an obit in the sun, a front cover of the NME declared him the original punk rocker. For a man who recorded just three albums, two of them difficult ones, the coverage appeared to outweigh his contribution to popular music. There seemed to be a rush by the media to romanticise this particular pop icon. Editor of Uncut magazine, Alan Jones. It was hold the front page. We really didn't even sit down and discuss what we should do. We had a, a feeling amongst ourselves that none of us would be here if it wasn't for people like Sid. And we immediately took a decision to pull the cover story we, we just finished and replace it with a, a tribute to Sid. Andrew Mayle, assistant editor at Mojo magazine. It was press day. We were closing the magazine. And I think if it hadn't have been Sid Barrett, if there hadn't have been that warmth of feeling out there, if there hadn't have been that need to sort of come together and talk about this guy, we wouldn't have got it done. It was astonishing the degree of love, yes, but also that need to, as people say, put the record straight. The media do like a good yarn about uh, mythical lost things that disappeared in the 60s or whatever. Sid's one, I think, he, he was worth it. We romanticise that period, the late 60s, because it will always seem to be a creative peak, and Sid will always be one of the representative figures for that creative peak. But his influence, obviously, is great, and uh, his is a particular one human personal sort of tragedy which um, has affected me and thousands and thousands of other people. If you want to call someone a kind of genius in terms of pop music, there are not many around. Possibly put Sid there, but then I'm a bit biased. There is a story there, which is the creative genius who burns out long before should have done. I was pretty astonished by the ubiquity of the coverage. Obviously there's an allure because he had become a bit of a mystery. He'd retired from music when he was still very young. So he was as famous for his absence as for what he'd done. And Sid became a tabloid figure because he became this mysterious, chubby little man who cycled around Cambridge. So he was tabloid as well. Why did these people want to talk to him? Why do they come to his door? The reason he hated all the attention was because he didn't ever understand what he'd done, that everybody wanted a bit of him. And I suspect a lot of people who are now writing for these newspapers and working with the radio were all part of that whole period of the 67 when Sid was a huge part of it. They certainly did make Sid's life romantic. And how did the Barrett family react to the unexpected media frenzy? Very surprised. After 30 years of being out of the limelight, I thought there would probably be no reaction. I've just been amazed. Pleased, really. Yeah, pleased for him. Although he would hate it. <laughs> He wanted to make his mark in life, and I think he did. A very unusual way, and that's, that, that would suit him.
I don't know. He was just such an amazingly unusual person. He was just so different and so original. And we need people like him. How I wish, how I wish you were here. A year on from his passing, the press coverage of Sid Barrett's death reveals a great deal about how alternative culture has been embraced by the musical mainstream. Sid Barrett was not well known, but the fulsome praise lavished on his songs and subsequent departure reveals he's regarded as unique. The influence of this hero of the 60s is more important than his recorded output, and that's what will be part of his enduring legacy. Let's leave the final words to his former bandmates, Rick Wright, David Gilmore, and Nick Mason. Sid, in a way, was the catalyst who produced Pink Floyd, so that however talented Roger or David or Rick are, but um, Sid actually deserves to take some credit for all of the best things that we've done since. I think without Sid, there probably would not have been the dark side of the moon, there probably wouldn't have even been the wall. And things that people still look fondly on today, like Bike and Arnold Lane, things like that. occupied nether regions of all our minds at various times. I mean, he was a brilliant, funny, intelligent, lovely chap. To see that whole thing disappear is a very troubling and very sad thing, not only for people like me who knew him fairly well, but obviously has that same thing for thousands of people who loved his work. was more than a product of his time. Sid was unique, and someone who's unique will write what they want and won't write what they feel they should write, because he had a very sort of individualistic way of living and looking at life. But um, I sadly miss him, even now. Please, please lend a hand. I'm only a person with Eskimo chain. I tattered my breath. The Thing About Sid was presented by me, Mark Radcliffe, and was a sugar production for BBC Radio 2. Online, on digital, and on 88 to 91 FM, this is Radio 2 from the BBC.